Amen. Thank you, worship team. May the Lord continuously increase you and take you deeper and deeper with him. Good morning, church. Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Is everybody well? Okay. Believing the Lord, we have no sick amongst us. But if they are sick amongst us, we rebuke that sickness in the name of Jesus Christ. Because, we because sickness is of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And that's how Jesus ruled. And we rule just. Call team to please, please figure out what happens with the sound so that everything can be at peace and honor only Jesus. You know, sometimes I think I'm going to make technical people come here to preach in front and know what happens when the sound does funny things. Eh? It disorients you completely. All right. So today, um, the Lord has given me a very heavy word. Um, that I'm trusting for grace to minister. But if um, one o'clock reaches before I finish, then you can call it part one. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We call you the master, for you are our master. As much as you are our father, and you are a soon coming king, we honor you, we honor your throne, we honor what you stand for, your greatness, your holiness, your righteousness, that you are all in all, and that in yourself you're complete. God, this morning we are not unaware of your ability to destroy man and create a whole new mankind. And I stand before you shaking and afraid, but not the fear that you have told us to rebuke, but the realization of how holy you are. The realization of the seriousness of your word and ministering your word. The realization of what it means to stand at your altar to minister to your children, oh God. I know that your word is eternal. Father, as I have spent time through this week preparing for this word, Master, Savior, and as I have asked you, oh God, I pray that, Father, you would come and intervene in this word, that you'd not, it would not be used to discourage, that the enemy would not use it to twist it into something it is not, Master, but that indeed it would be used to edify your children, to rebuke them, and to urge them in Christ-likeness, O oh God. Indeed, Lord, I stand on your word, O oh God, in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, the words of Peter, King of glory, that if I or anyone else should come and preach any other gospel other than what has been preached, O oh God, in your word, that let us be accursed, O oh God. So, Lord, may my mouth be purified in your presence. May my heart be purified in your presence. May my mind be purified in your presence. I give myself to you, Jehovah, as a vessel, O Lord Jehovah God, as a living sacrifice, King of glory. And I ask for help from Zion, Jehovah. Deal with every demonic entity and every spirit of man that is wicked that will be seeking to intercept this word, O God, even into the airspace, Jehovah, in the the name of Jesus Christ, there shall be no sideshows, even on the online Jehovah God, to come and distract your children, to come and irritate your children. We urge you, Master Savior, to cause the babies to be at peace as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, let there be a stillness in the atmosphere as we sit at the feet of the Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of God, you know I can do nothing without you. And there is nothing possible without you, Spirit of God. Your word says that the gospel is not just about eating and making merry, but it's a gospel of power. 
now. So let your power spring forth, mighty God, from this vessel in the name of Jesus Christ and from above, Jehovah God. Let Shekinah glory come upon your children in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, let there be weeping in a realization, Master, Savior, of where we are wrong, Jehovah. Let there, oh God, be a sorrow that leads to repentance, Master, Savior. Let there be no self-preservation, but let anything that is not of you today, let it die in the name of Jesus Christ not just here Jehovah God but even in the online family but over the atmosphere for words have power and let the words that emerge oh God from your throne Jehovah penetrate through the nation and speak over the nation in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and King Lord Jesus I acknowledge you as the Messiah I acknowledge you as the Son of God I acknowledge you as the one that walked a whole 33 years without sin. That for all your lifetime, you never sinned. And at the age of 12, I, I acknowledge and I declare that indeed you were taken to the temple. And in that place, you were lost in the presence of God. And when your parents noticed that you were not there, after they had gone away a little bit, you had already been separated. And by the time they were finding you to rebuke you, you asked them, did you not know I was in my father's house? Master, Savior, may we be aware of what it means to be in our father's house. May we be creatures of habit of being in our father's house in the presence of the Lord Jehovah God. Let it be our best place, Jehovah King of glory. Oh Lord Jehovah, let us be people of prayer. Let us be people that spend time in the presence of the most high God. Father God, I rebuke every prayerless spirit. I rebuke every work of flesh. I rebuke Master Savior, lips that lie and deceive Master Savior in the name of Jesus Christ. And and even today, Jehovah, I ask you to expose those who pretend master savior to be of the church of the Lord living God, but they are sent on a mission or are used by the enemy. Father God, we refuse any part of that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. And Father, teach us to know what is authentic, but we know that we can only know that which is authentic when we spend time in your word and when we spend time in your presence, for that is how we know who you are. Father, we thank you. Thank you for what it means to be loved by you. For we are so loved, we are so loved, we are so loved by you. Thank you for your love. Come on, somebody lift up your hands before the presence of the Lord and begin to thank him for his love for you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. It's by your grace that we are not consumed. We honor you, Jehovah. You who loves, oh God, even when we are not lovable. We want to ask you, King of glory, that you would teach us to love like you, Jehovah God. For we cannot claim Master Savior to be of you and not love one another. For you have declared, oh Jesus, that we, when we claim that we are yours, we must first of all love our brother, love our sister, and this love, oh God, is not dependent on what they do. So teach us to truly love Jehovah God and give us your very nature this morning, Lord Jesus. Your word does say we have your very nature. But God, we are tired of it not manifesting. So let it manifest, Lord Jehovah God, that people will begin to know that we are your disciples because of how we love, because of our kindness, because of our mercy, because of our choice of words, Master, Savior. Remove every self-righteousness in the name of Jesus Christ, oh God. Remove every form of bitterness. Remove all the selfishness and, and jealousies, Master Savior. Remove the competition, oh God. Remove the clamoring, Master Savior, for popularity or to be seen, Jehovah. For what does it mean to be seen by a human being and rejected by God Almighty? My Father, we refuse it in the name of Jesus Christ, oh God. We call upon your name, Jehovah. We make room now for your word. We make room now for the kingdom of kings and the Lord of lords. Father God, if anybody came here to see me, I want to speak a rebuke into the atmosphere. In the name of Jesus Christ, I disconnect myself from them, Jehovah God. For even I came to see you, Jehovah God. If anyone came to see a human being, Master, Savior, they are accursed. Almighty God, for cursed is the one who looks to man. There is no vessel, Almighty Father, that you use, Almighty King, that should be glorified apart from you. Let Jehovah only be seen. 
Lord God, we want to speak your word that says that when we lift up the name of Jesus, you will draw all men to yourself. So, Father, in this sanctuary, we nullify, oh God, any issue of people being drawn to a human being in the name of Jesus Christ. We declare that ours is to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, Master, Savior, come down and draw all men unto yourself. That, Father God, the desire of the children of God, when they come to the house of God, would be to seek you, to pursue you, to love you more, to desire to obey you, Master, Savior, to live in your word and to live by the Spirit of God and be led by him. Father, we refuse these new age teachings. We refuse, oh God, this thing of idolizing a human being. It shall not happen in this sanctuary. In the name of Jesus Christ, we refuse it. We reject it. We shall not agree with it. In the name of Jesus Christ, only Jesus will be seen. Jesus be exalted, Jesus be magnified, Jesus be glorified. You're the only one that deserves the glory. Take your glory, take your glory. Father, men have helped me along, but no man has saved me. Men have helped me alone, but men have also forsaken me so often, Master, that I've come to learn that it's only you, Jesus. It's only you, Jesus. And everything we need can be found in you and in your word. We have everything we need for life and for godliness in you and in your word. So we refuse laziness. We refuse laziness. We reject every form of laziness in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Hallelujah in the highest. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So today's message is entitled, The Synagogue of Satan. Tell somebody it's going to get hot. Don't say it in the air. Tell somebody. Like for real, communicate. It's going to get hot in here. Okay, and I'm not talking about hell. I'm talking about the fire of God. I'm going to talk about the synagogue of Satan. It's not a message that I've ever heard anybody preach, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody has. I checked online, nobody seems to have preached on it. The synagogue of Satan. Okay? We're not going to talk about the church of Satan. We're going to talk about the synagogue of Satan. Although synagogue and church pretty much the same. The Jews call it a synagogue, we call it the church. Anyway, so let's turn to Revelations. That's where it's found. If you've never heard it, it's found in the book of Revelation. 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 Ooh, let just say Revelation. Thank you, Jesus. It is well. I'm studying the Kikuyu Bible. So let me see what they call it as you guys are searching. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Aye? Okay. I'm wondering which Kikuyu Bible I have here because it does not end with Revelation. What is Makabai or Makafai? Huh? I hope it's not that other Kawa Bible. <gasps> That's one I downloaded? Dear Jesus. And we have been reading it over here and feeling funny but wondering. How do I get the real Kikuyu Bible? The devil is bad. Yeah, because I'm looking and I'm like, the last book of my Bible is not Second Makafai, and I don't know what Makafai is. <laughs> I tell you, the devil, the devil, the devil. So I want to download bad eye. Hey, hey. Now, I guess that was supposed to be a demonstration of the tricks of the enemy. Eh? Yeah. Satan is full of trickery, by the way. So Revelation chapter 2. Okay. Revelation of chapter 2, verse 9. We can start from verse 8 for the sake of um, knowing a bit of history. And to the angel, divine messenger of the church in Smyrna, I write, uh, no, write, these are the words of the first and the last absolute deity, the son of God, who died and came to life again. I know your suffering and your poverty, but you're rich. And how you are blasphemed and slandered by those who say they are Jews and are not, 
but are a synagogue of Satan. Okay? So anybody was about to walk out of church this morning thinking I've just come to preach about the devil? Okay, it's there, okay? It's in the Bible. Okay? But, but are, are a synagogue of Satan. They are Jews only by blood and do not believe and honor the God whom they claim to worship. Fear nothing that you're about to suffer. Be aware that the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested in your faith. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful to the point of death if you must die for your faith. And I will give you the crown consisting of life. He who has an ear, let him hear and heed what the Spirit of God says to the churches. He who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God will not be hurt by the second death, which is the lake of fire. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Again, it's interesting because the synagogue of Satan is mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, and then it's mentioned again in Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. So that's not a coincidence. So we go again to Revelation chapter 3, verse 9. Take note, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know without any doubt that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my endurance, my command to persevere. So you can see the reason why they will come and bow. Eh? You know, one of the things that Satan has used in the church is for us to claim the promises of God without the work of the cross. That is witchcraft. It doesn't work like that. Okay. So the, those who are of the synagogue of Satan will come and kneel before us and bow and proclaim and because they know that you love that Jehovah God loves us only because we have kept the word of endurance by my, which is God's command to persevere i will keep you safe from the hour of trial that hour which is about to come on the whole in, inhabited world to test those who live on the earth i am coming quickly hold tight to what you have so that no one will take your crown by leading you to renounce the faith. And this is um, to the church in Philadelphia, okay? Maybe you can just read from above so that we know why they, they themselves were told. The others were being slandered, uh, but these ones are being told that these guys will come and bow. So there are different promises here. Let's go to verse 7. And to the angel, the divine messenger of the church in Philadelphia, write, these are the words of the Holy One, the true one, he who has the key to the house of David. He who opens and no one will be able to shut, and he who shuts and no one opens. I know your deeds. See, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. For you have a little power and have kept my word and have not renounced or denied my name. So these, those three things are critical to note. Yeah, They have just a little power, but they have kept God's word and they have not renounced the name of God and they have not denied his name, okay? Take note, then that's when he talks about the synagogue of Satan, okay? So please note that th the Lord is not even saying, you know, you guys are, you know, you, because the church in their dossier is the one, you find that, that these are the words of amen and trust and faithful and true witness, the beginning and origin. I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. Okay, those are different, different, different things. I think, does another version say that this is the faithful church? It does, right? This is the faithful church because of the open door. I know the faithful church is one that's opened for the door. Some years back, I saw a very big, um, okay, whose jacket? Okay, all right. Sasawa. So I saw a very, I saw a very big um, light, a lot of light, um, like cities. Eh? So, you know, as I was looking at it, God began to manifest in different ways through these cities that uh, he was showing me. And then I was taken to, and it's like the Lord was just taking me around showing me what was going on. Then suddenly I found myself in a circular kind of sitting where um, I could see people having a discussion. And what they were doing, they were actually talking about God. The interesting thing is there was a sheep, a very clean sheep, 
at the very, very center. And it, it seemed like it was just paying attention to what they were discussing, but they were discussing the word of God. Then God told me, this is my faithful church. Then he told me, amongst the cities I have shown you, there are also some faithful people in those cities. Then he told me, now watch. All of a sudden, it's like I blinked. But as I blinked, just a normal blink, I looked, the ship was gone, and all the people were gone. So the chairs were missing. And it was an open field, by the way. There was grass. It was, it was dark in terms of, as in, it was um, under the cover of darkness in terms of it was nighttime. But they were out in an open field that made me think of maybe that's how the shepherds were on the night that Jesus was born. But there was, and there was no building anywhere close by, but they had just set some chairs and they were discussing the word of God and they were discussing about God, basically. And this ship was seated right at the center. They couldn't see the ship and the ship was not seeing anything. It was just paying attention to what was going on. As I blinked like this, the ship was gone and the people were gone. Then I turned to look at the cities and it's like I was lifted again before I understood what was going on. I was lifted again and I could see people popping up from different places, from different places, popping up. But there was one particular city, and God didn't give me a name. Nobody, nobody. Their lights were on, but nobody was lifted up. You know, Jesus is coming soon. And I know some people don't believe in the rapture, but, you know, the goodness with the word of God is that it's not a democratic word where he's checking for consensus. He has said in his word that we shall be caught up in the air. And, you know, the, and at some point later on, the dead in Christ shall also rise and all that. Then the word of God also is very, very clear. In Acts chapter 1, they are told very, very clearly that this same Jesus you see ascending will come back the same way. Okay? So there are many, many scriptures. So whether you believe it or not, it will happen. And the sad thing, if you don't believe it, then you won't prepare for the rapture. And now the church is getting ready to go home. That's where we are at. We are getting ready to go home. However, there's something called the synagogue of Satan, which the Lord asked me to preach on today. Satan began to learn that he cannot penetrate the church uh, from the outside. So he realized if he does, he'll be rebuked, we will bind, we will do all sorts of things, we'll send fire and all that. So what Satan is doing is two things. Either sending an agent of the enemy who then penetrates, and you know, every appearance of them is very godly and very, what is it called? The, you know, the outward appearances of godliness, okay? Um, and they do everything right by the word of God, but the Lord has begun to reveal to me certain traits about those who are used by the enemy, in particular if they are agents of Satan. The Lord has begun to reveal to me some things about them. Now, agents of Satan will not be able to enter a church of prayer. So if a church is filled with prayer and it's a church that is, you know, the, the, the people in the church pray. That's what I'm talking about. And of course, led by the ministry team that they lead. And I'm not talking about prayer in groups necessarily. I'm talking about you have a private time of prayer. And then when we come corporately, we are able to pray corporately and we love to pray. So far, unfortunately, I don't know what's going on in this church. I'm really, really praying about it. But we don't seem yet to be sold out into prayer. And I guess it's a prayer item for me and the leadership team that we need to pray people to be awoken by the Spirit of God, to love to pray and to love the Word of God. I think we're still at the level where we love it when someone preaches with power. We love it when the minister is trending online, so you're in the, like a celebrity church or something like that. And I feel very afraid for anyone who is like that because then it means that you're following a human being. But if you love to pray and to spend time in the presence of God, you can never be deceived. Okay? Um, I'm going to talk about the word synagogue just to demystify it. So the synagogue is a word that comes uh, from the, the, the Greek language, just like sozo, okay, it comes from the Greek language. For those of you who don't know, if you Google, go to Google and type biblical meaning sozo, it will bring you 110 scriptures, okay? So it's in the Bible, and it's a Greek, it's a Greek word used in the New Testament 110 times, the word sozo. So... Um, the, it's, so this, this word synagogue is a Greek word that is used to mean the assembly of men or a congregation. Okay, as simple as that. Um, and it was used a lot like we use the English word, the church today, okay, which is a gathering of the faithful. Um, then when we talk about now the synagogue of Satan, 
um, it means then it's an assembly of a congregation, but it's made of individuals that are claiming, and biblically in terms of the Bible, they are claiming to be part of the church, but they are not in the church. And today I'll not be ministering about satanic agents. The Lord has he, with his faithfulness, enabled us to be able to overcome that after very many years of a lot of drama. If I told you half of the stories, it would be so scary. Um, but one day, maybe I'll, I'll just give you a little story. One, one, one day, we had a lady, and um, one day, I'll not be very specific about it so that nobody is able to tell, but we had a lady, and one day, she actually lured um, a man to her doorstep, um, and the guy went to her doorstep, and the moment that the guy arrived at the gate, I, I was able to look back, because the guy arrived at the gate at just some minutes to 11 a.m., and I was on a long fast, but instantly I started diarrheaing. I wasn't eating anything um, day or night, but I started to diarrhea. So I was just making trips to the toilet, and I was like, what am I diarrheaing? And instantly I knew it was a spiritual issue. So the Lord told me, you know, you have diarrhea. So you can go and explain to your bosses you're not feeling well and request to leave. So I went and I told my bosses, I'm not feeling very well. I'm sorry, I have the runs. I have to leave. I have to get to a place where I'm comfortable next to a toilet. So I left, and uh, the first step, uh, stop that I did, we had church at that time in Kileleshua. So I went, I stopped in Kileleshua. I found some people there who were part of the ministry. I told them there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Something has entered the environment. And as such, I've started to diarrhea without even understanding. And by the way, when you're, when you're very prayerful, and I'm not calling myself very prayerful, I still have a lot of room for improvement. But when you're very prayerful and you spend very close time with the Lord, you will find that sometimes diarrhea is not necessarily a sign of a bacteria. Sometimes it's actually an invasion in the church of Jesus Christ, okay? The same goes for fever. But now don't become super spiritual. And then if you have diarrhea, you decide it is always something that has entered the atmosphere. You know, if you walk with God, he will tell you what is causing the diarrhea, okay? So, um, I, so I, I went and I just informed um, the people that and then I left and I went home. I prayed a little bit and I said, Father, you must reveal. He didn't speak to me while I was in the church and then I went home and when I went home, um, I went into deep and intense prayer and uh, I got a phone call a little bit later on. Um, I think it was that day and I got to know what it was. And the amazing thing is, I was calling during the, the, that time. I was also calling um, the Kathy. Could you mute my mic for a moment? It's okay. So um, I um, I found that, uh, you know, I was, uh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, it's gone. Thanks. Amen. I tell you, the attacks that we face on this pulpit, you'll never understand. So anyway, um, I was actually just feeling like there were arrows just coming into my heart. Eh? Just, I could actually feel like arrows being sent across. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, and it's part of what you deal with when you're on the pulpit, and that's why you have to be very prepared when you climb onto the pulpit. And then the Lord has just reminded me that I'm, I also didn't put on the armor of God, so I've just put it on and it's disappeared instantly. Anyway, so um, why am I sharing? I'm sharing that so that you can learn, okay? That's what I'm sharing. It's not for any other information. So I'd called this lady or oh, let me say this woman, I'd called her to ask her of her testimony of what social sessions had done for her. And uh, she'd been laughing as she was telling me. And it was a mockery kind of laugh. And I remember thinking, that's very strange. And then she asks me whether I've talked to this other guy. And I'm like, why are you suggesting that I talk to the other guy? And it turns out that they were in bed together at that very minute. I tell you, the number of people that confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but they're on another assignment, whether knowingly or unknowingly, are very many. And this is why I say to the children of God, guard yourself. Don't assume that because we go to the same church, because we go to the same cell group, that we are all going in the same direction. We have to learn to discern and to tell what we are dealing with. But you can't do that unless you're a person of prayer. 
when you spend time in the presence of God, he sharpens your senses. When you spend time in the presence of God, he warns you. When you spend time in the presence of God, he begins to trust you with information. When you spend time in the presence of God, he leads you to scripture that will teach you because there's nothing new under the sun. When you spend time looking for God in the scriptures instead of saying, you know me, I don't hear God's voice and despairing. Yeah? And yet the Bible says, my sheep know my voice. So what are you? Okay? You stand on the word of God. It says, my sheep know my voice. So you go before God. And you say, am I not your sheep? You say that your sheep hear your voice. So what is stopping me from hearing your voice? And sometimes you'll find that the synagogue of Satan is something that was set up even in your family. And I keep telling people, do not ever underrate the things that happen up, up, up the tap. You know that pipe we keep talking about? Don't underrate. Just because you found your grandmother wearing a katabaya, a katabaya is a headscarf, okay? That is written Women's Guild or CG, whatever other names they are written. Just because you found them wearing that jacket that says, you know, now you're a, a man of honor. Don't assume that things are the way they look. We must enter prayer. And at the place of prayer, it's a place of death. And as you die in the presence of God, as you submit yourself wholly to God, as you render your members in the presence of God, also acknowledging you had a life before the day you got saved. So you also have to deal with the life you lived before you got saved. Otherwise, whatever you don't submit to God, Satan will use it. So we have to learn submission to God. Giving ourselves in to God. Realizing that the moment you begin to think that I'm mature, that you have been saved 28 years, my friend, you know nothing. You know nothing. Okay? And I'm the one who's been saved for 28 years, so I'm saying to myself, I know nothing. Because the enemy of the new fire is the old fire. The one that's dying out. But because Jesus moved once in your life, and because Jesus manifested himself at some point in your life, you're still holding on to that place. You know, someone said, the worst place to be is where God used to be. You see, our God is always moving. He doesn't change, but he's always moving. He's always moving. He's always manifesting. He's always, there are seasons, there are changes, there are, there are times and everything. And you have to understand, in this season, in this kairos, what is God doing? What does God desire for me to do? We're in a season of revival. And this is a season of prayer. And prayer cannot be a season, by the way. So this is our eternal season. So anything else must take a back step. We are praying. We are searching the, the, the scriptures so that we pray within the scriptures, so that we find the will of God, so that we know how to respond to what God says. And when God speaks, again, we go back to the scriptures because God never speaks outside the scriptures. We double check the word of God, prayer, fellowship. The word of God, prayer, fellowship. The word of God, prayer, fellowship. And inside there is me praying more than I'm spending time praying with other people. You know, one of the lies Satan uses is a switch of your personal prayer life with corporate prayer. I learned that very quickly as a minister. I found that I was so busy in prayer meetings and leading prayer meetings and leading people to pray and spending time preaching and telling people about Jesus. So in the evening, I would go to sleep saying, thank you, Jesus, it was such a powerful day. And out, I'm out. Then the next morning again, then I began to feel so dry. And I was wondering, why am I feeling like this? You see, when you're praying with other people, we must pray with other people, by the way, but I want to discourage the issue of praying with other people as a group that has been formed when we already have an intercessory ministry in this church. Every prayer group must be under authority. 
So let's use our cell groups as prayer groups. Let's use the ministry team as prayer groups. We can pray in twos, and of course, every married couple must pray together. We can pray as a group that is family. But whenever any other group begins to arise that has not been commissioned from the altar, it may begin well. But a lot of times, Satan can use it if the authority is not there. Are we understanding that? So you, can be, you have the right heart, you have the zeal, but the enemy begins to use it in the wrong way as an informal leader begins to sprout and to emerge. Amen? So let's be very, very careful. I remember a friend of mine telling me about how a certain lady who's very, very disobedient um, had decided to start a little group that she was mentoring and discipling and uh, she was, she was uh, having a prayer fellowship with them and she'd meet them outside of church. But sometimes, depending on where it was, they would gather. So they would meet. So they began to notice, hmm, there are some people who are meeting behind the kahema over there every Sunday. And we don't know anything about them. So when they went to check, they found it was her. You know, they had to rebuke her. And when they rebuked her, she said to canine them. Why? Because you've started to raise up your own little thing and a little altar that then does not even glorify Jesus. Amen? So let's be careful. And the thing is, by the way, let me tell you right now, where we are at since January, God has been so faithful. There is no one in this church at the moment who doesn't have a zeal for God. Everybody has a zeal for God. So even the prayer groups, the meetings that are coming up, they are coming out of a zeal for God. Okay? But then because a lot of us are very young spiritually, the enemy can use certain things. So we need to learn and be careful lest our zeal causes us to sin. Are we together? Amen. Okay. So, um, and I bless the Lord, by the way, we are having such an open heaven in Sozo Church from January. I, I'm sure you guys can feel it. And we just bless the Lord for that. Eh? Now, I want to go back to Paul's definition of a spiritual Jew, okay? Remember that uh, uh, Paul talks about a spiritual Jew. And we are all spiritual Jews, by the way, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We are adopted. Um, Romans chapter 2 verse 29 says, He is a Jew who is one out inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Okay? Let me read that again. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God, okay? So you need to know, that is Romans chapter 2, verse 29, for those of you who are writing notes. I encourage you to write notes, and then after the service and through the week, to meditate upon the word that was preached. That's how we grew. We used to write notes, okay? We'd carry our notebooks, and we'd write down notes, and then through the week, we would go through the scriptures, and then try to find other scriptures. We didn't have Google, so we had to trust the Holy Spirit to lead us to other scriptures that then had a reflection of that. We didn't have fancy Bibles. A lot of us just used the New Testament little Bible, and then um, that was it, okay? So let us um, know that. But then I also need to encourage us to know that several in the Bible, it is also said there's no Jew and there's no Gentile, okay? But the reason why this scripture is particularly uh, mentioned um, is uh, because Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 22, that salvation is for the Jews, okay? All right? Although, again, uh, you know, there was a proclamation, I believe it was Paul, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So, um, but Jesus himself in John chapter 4, verse 22, said salvation is for the Jews. So that's why we must proclaim when we declare that we are spiritual Jews by adoption by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can also refer to more on this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 to 29. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 to 29, and then Romans chapter 4, 
verse 16. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 to 29, and Romans chapter 4, verse 16. But I want to urge you not to focus so much on being a spiritual Jew and use it only as something that you use for jurisdiction, okay? When you're proclaiming jurisdiction. And then, of course, when we go to Israel. We're not going to Israel. We're going in May, by the way, to Israel. For those of you who are interested, please let's get involved. We're going to redeem our family altars from Israel in terms of any bit that is left so that we can proclaim even on that holy soil and on that holy ground and stand in the place of covenant where the Ark of the Covenant was brought in the Davidic covenant. That will be one of the main things we will do. For those that are not baptized and want to be baptized in the Jordan, we can organize that. If you're baptized, we cannot baptize you again in the Jordan. Personally, I'm not very sure I want to enter that Jordan. And it's really dirty, but I'm sure we can find a clean place. Eh? But uh, it was not looking very clean. Yeah, so 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 says, 2 Peter chapter 2, because of time, allow me to just keep moving, if you can just write down on notes. Eh? 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1, it says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly Bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bring upon themselves a swift destruction. Now, you need to know something about this scripture. It's talking about people who begin well, okay? Remember all foolish Galatians? People who begin well. But they begin well, but after some time, they begin to move away. One of the things you have to know about this gospel we have received is that you must work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If you do not, you can move away. I can tell you that I have had a lot of moving away before the Lord completely delivered me in, uh, about eight years ago. So I know it is possible to move away. So you must always be alert. And what makes us move away? Life can happen. Okay, so something really painful comes and instead of dealing with it in the presence of the Lord, you either take it head on or you retreat and it destroys you or it interferes with you and God doesn't deal with it. If you deal with anything difficult in your life, you must learn to deal with it in the presence of God and also to allow yourself to be surrounded by the body of Christ that will surround you to bring healing. And that was, these are the people who, you know, like your spiritual authority, that's why it's important to be in a cell group. You need to be part of a cell group. A cell group comes from the word cells that are in the, the body. We have the body and then the cells, the little cells. The life of the church is in those cells. Okay? So submit yourself to a cell group. And by the way, I have a big problem with somebody who is trying to get very close to me and sending me messages or anything like that, but you're not submitted to a cell group. For me, I have a very big question mark. Because one of the signs of the church of the synagogue of Satan, let me call it the synagogue of Satan, is that they struggle with submission. And you can use any excuse you want to use. You can say, oh, you know, I was hurt. Uh, are we the ones who hurt you? But also, you know the people who said they were hurt, and therefore they don't go to church or they don't go to cell? One of the things I've noticed about them is that they still go to the offices where they're hurt. When it comes to church, they've been hurt, so they stay away. That is one of the things Satan wants. Satan uses divide and rule. Okay? And by the way, we were hurt. Growing in our faith, we were hurt. In the 90s, in the year 2000 and going on forward, we were hurt. But you know, I'm shocked. I mean, I, I believe this is a new age doctrine. It never crossed my mind that if I'm hurt, that I leave church and go somewhere else. Me, I knew where I was sent. So I knew that the Lord had taught me that when you go to a church, you've prayed, you've waited upon him, and he sent you to that church. And he's not sent you to that church to go and warm the chairs. He sent you to that church to go and grow. And then once you grow, and as you're submitting yourself to the authority, and you understand what that church stands for and what the mission of that church is, and what the direction of that church is, then you can offer yourself to help out on so many things that need to be done in the church. But we need to learn to submit ourselves. You see, one of the things I've learned about uh, uh, those who are of the synagogue of Satan is that they don't want to be in a small group. Because in the small group, they'll be scrutinized. It's very comfortable when we are here, 200 people, you know, and it's hard to be able to see you. Or you're online, and therefore, you know, you can be sending your tithes and your offerings and letting me know how much I bless your life, but Kumbe, you're not submitted to anybody. 
and which is also the other reason why I'm very uncomfortable about meeting someone who does not fellowship here. Why? Because I have to ask you, where do you fellowship? And you know what part of, part of what Satan is using in terms of this synagogue of Satan? And remember, these are born-again Christians who have been deceived by the enemy. Part of what he's using is, I go, I fornicate in one church. Then, maybe I'm in leadership. When they look like they're finding out, I run away. And I go to another church. And as I'm worshipping, they begin to notice, hey, you know, this one has a voice. And then they come and talk to you, and they're like, ah, finally, somebody's noticing me. You know, in the church where I was, they were not appreciated. But then let me tell you, one of the things I've learned to flee from is someone who comes and tells me that there was something wrong with their former pastor. This morning, someone actually tried to send me a message about a pastor. And then they wanted to send me links. I said, thank you for looking out for me, but please don't send me the links. And the person goes on to send the links. So I, I, I deleted, delete, delete, delete. You have to be able to notice. And sometimes, by the way, it doesn't mean that the person is necessarily of the synagogue of Satan. But I couldn't help but wonder, are you going to church today? Are you submitted to Christ today? Where have you been? You see, there are a lot of Christians who move into the world. A lot of pastors, too, that move into the world. And you don't realize they have moved into the world because the giftings of the Lord are without repentance. So you find the gift is still manifesting. So you might not be able to tell, even though you're sensing something's not right. Something is wrong. What's going on here? Are we together? So we need to be spiritually alert. Our antennas need to be so focused on Christ so that we're able to know. In your own home, you might go and hire somebody, bring them into your house, and that person is the one who comes for distraction as an agent or someone from the synagogue of Satan. I get shocked by women. I would call them lazy women who come and tell me, oh, you know, my house girl, I just, you know, I ask them, Have you, is anybody praying with you? And they tell me my house girl. And there's nothing wrong with a praying house girl. But you, how can the person you have employed in your house be the one who seeks God for you to come and tell you? At least you, they prophesy, see you what? At you, you know, my house girl told me that my husband is cheating on me. Okay. Has God told you that your husband is cheating on you before you start packing and moving out? No, 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 no. But you know, my house girl, she keeps prophesying and things are right, my friend. Even if I, as your minister, Come and tell your husband is cheating on you. Can you retreat and seek the Lord's face before you start reacting? I could be wrong. Maybe your husband is, is thinking about cheating on you and I'm seeing it in the prophetic. And all we're supposed to do is stop it. Are we together? So learn to test everything. Be very, very sensitive. Because the purpose of the synagogue of Satan is to move you away from Christ. And if you find yourself with a friend or anyone who you're finding that now they've become a bigger reference than your Bible. They've become a bigger reference than, than you know, than you, so you cry the whole night, you don't pray about it, and you're just looking at your watch because you're not going to six. So you're not six if you care. You're waiting for six o'clock to reach so that then you can call your friend. My friend, something is wrong there. Let's go on. Let's go to St. Jude. The letter of St. Jude. It's only one chapter. And it's easy. It's just before Revelations. So that's why I said let's go to St. Jude, okay? The book of St. Jude, the letter of, 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 of Jude as it's called, verse 2 says, May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. I want to tell you that the carriers of the glory of God carry mercy, they carry peace, and they carry love. Those who are of the synagogue of Satan carry division. Okay? They carry division. Our God does not divide. So to the, uh, may, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you, filling your heart with the spiritual well-being 
and serenity experienced by those who walk closely with God. Somebody take this home with you and pray over it if it is not your current dispensation because you must walk with a spiritual well-being and a serenity. Serenity is just, you're just happy and you can't explain why you're happy. You're peaceful and you can't explain why you're peaceful. Even in the midst of what looks like a world war. Peace is not, shalom is not the absence of war. Shalom is just the presence of God. You know, when you have little children, and I'll come back to this, when you have little children, one of the things little children do is that they sleep. And one of my daughters used to have this habit where through the court, she used to make sure she holds somebody's hand. And because for me, I love my sleep, and I don't have that kind of patience, she used to sleep on her dad's side because the dad has that kind of patience. So they used to hold hands the whole night. Me, I don't even hold my own husband's hand. So they would hold hands, as in when we were sleeping, but here she is, she has to hold daddy's hand. So she would hold daddy's hand, but if daddy's hand by any chance slipped, she'd wake up and start moving. So daddy would notice and then reach out again and they hold hands. Now, kwambia watoto. Watoto, watoto, watoto. So this I'm using as a demonstration. As a Christian, no matter what's going on in your life, if trials should come, if the storms should come, they will come. By the way, it's promised. Tribulation should come. It looks like, you know, don't be a chicken licking. The sky is falling in, okay? What you do, yours is just to open your eyes and confirm the position of Christ. If he's still seated on the throne, then that's fine. Because he has not abdicated his throne. So you surrender yourself to that process and whatever is going on because unfortunately, by the way, if you want to really grow, you will either deal with your own body and beat it up through fasting and prayer and a very rigorous time of seeking the Lord and separation. Either you will do that or the Lord will do it for you. For me, I've come to learn I'd rather do it myself. I'd rather do it myself. So I beat up my own body to Christ like this. Because when I do that, when the Lord allows something to come, if God is allowing something to come, where is it coming from? If he's allowing it, where is it coming from? Bereans, mkwapi. Where is something coming from if God has to allow it? It's coming from Satan, yes. Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. Okay? It's coming from Satan. God will do nothing unless, I mean, Satan will do nothing unless God allows him, okay? But sometimes these things come from God. And so you need to thank the Lord for his chastisement and then tell him, please give me the grace to be able to handle this chastisement. There are things you will go through that will cure you eternally from gossip, okay? One of the things that you'll go through that cure you eternally from gossip is when you're gossiped on. Nicely. You just get a double portion of what you've been giving to others. Then you feel it nicely, a good one. Then as you're going through it and saying, God, why are they saying these things about me? I didn't even do them. Da, 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 da. So and so is the one who said it. So and so is the one who said it. Then God tells you, look at the other three hands and fingers where they're pointing. Niwewe, niwewe, niwewe. For Father, Son, Holy Spirit. My friend, you better learn your lesson quickly. Zip your mouth and stop it. Some of us have a habit of backsliding. Kiki umana, unarudi kwa world. Siju unarudi kwa world waji. You know me, by the way, I don't remember what the world used to look like. Eh? And the world I used to know, I bless God, it does not exist anymore. And I just need to drive through this gate early in the morning or late in the evening and just begin by seeing the nudity and how people are grinding against each other and say, Lord, even when we were in the world, our world didn't look like that. And I asked the Lord at one point in my life, I told him, shut that door. And any time I ascend to a new level, shut the door of the old level. So that there's nowhere to go back to. That's one of the prayers I pray. So that there's nowhere to go back to. Nikitan kumefungwa. So I must always keep ascending. Keep ascending with Christ. So the world that I knew does not exist anymore. I can't stand their music. I can't stand their behaviors. All they do is drink and they grind at each other. When you're driving out, the men look like ravenous wolves. They are looking out to see una kwanga mgani. When you're coming in, they look like they can't wait to tear your clothes apart so they can jump on you. My friend, which world is this? I am not going there. To do what? To do what? With people who are just high all the time. They can't even make sense. 
Nothing. The world has nothing for me. But some of us have the habit of going to the world. Kido go to just a little bit. That's all it takes. And one day when you're in that world, you catch something there that by the time you're running back to the house of God, it will just be reminding you of the world. You know? It reminds you of the world. I don't know if I still have it. Yes, I still have it. I have a scar on my leg which reminds me of a foolish decision I made in 2012. The Lord told me, don't do it. Forgive. Let go. But who am I? My friend. I decided, Jesus, by this time, I'm not hanging you behind for long. Just, I just need five minutes. Five. Just funga macho, stay there kidogo. My friend, I have a scar on my leg. That reminds me of that stupidity. And the Lord told me, I will heal it, but I'll not heal it completely. So that when you look, you will always remember. And you will never, ever, ever dare to hold unforgiveness in your heart again. Some things are worse than that. We had our brother William Seymour disobeying God. And remember, disobedience to God is, God has told you to get up and go and tell somebody something. Or God has told you to get up, move out of your house, and go to a small house where you will rent and give somebody your other house. Yes, God's instructions will be like that. You disobey, you disobey, you disobey. William Seymour had not gone to the world. William Seymour is a guy of Azusa Revival. He had just been told by the Lord, I've called you to minister. He said, me, I'm a son of a slave. Remember the beginning of the year, we were looking at the two scenarios of Zacharias and Mary. Similar messages, but the response. Zacharias ends up mute for nine months. And then Mary ends up blessed. Similar answers. Same angel, but how you handle it. Disobedience is a costly affair. And if you get involved with the synagogue of Satan, they will tell you, ah, no, our God is not like that. They live in quote scripture. They quote scripture to cause you to disobey God. But the feeling continue to, continues to nag at you. God tells you, you're not in the right job. He's giving you a warning so that you can find another job. It doesn't mean quit. You know, some of you can boy, you're not in the right job, you quit. That is foolishness and God doesn't expect that immediately necessarily. Unless he has added, you're not in the right job and you must leave now. You see, he's very specific. So if he says you're not in the right job, go to him and say, Father, what is wrong with this job? He might not tell you. If he doesn't tell you, say, I hear you, master. I'm not in the right job. What would you have me do? Would you have me leave now? Or will you provide me something else so that I can wind up and then I'm able to move to the other thing? God tells you that person is a corrupt person. And I'm not talking about the corruption in Etunajuanga. I'm talking about corrupted. Corrupted in the form of the person is not submitted to the Lord. Their heart is corrupted, their mind is corrupted, their behavior is corrupted, their choices are corrupted. And God tells you, bad company corrupts good morals. And that person, ah, but God. In fact, she's been saved longer than me. The spirit of God is not foolish. The spirit of God is a spirit of wisdom. That relationship you're in, it does not glorify me. And you're there saying, but God, it's a pastor. Who says every pastor is for you to marry? Have you sought the Lord? Have you sought the Lord on the things you need to know? If you spend time in the presence of God, kneeling before him, submitted before him. In fact, my advice to Christians is if you're very busy, separate your prayer time into three different hours. Early in the morning, let it be adoration before you leave your house. Adore the Lord. Early in the morning, will you hear my voice, O oh God? Let the morning bring me 
word of your unfailing love. So at that time, you receive the love of God, you give the Lord love. But you're also preparing yourself for the rest of the day. You're armoring up. You're asking him to let you know what your assignment is for that day. You're also asking God to guide you and to lead you in every way. You're, you're, you are preparing yourself, surrendering yourself. You're also asking God to release his angels to come and stand with you and guide you. You're asking God to sanctify you through the day and that you will not walk in the wrong way before God. You're telling God, I am going into the house of men. My office is the house of men. But as I'm wearing this badge that I'm wearing today, I will be in the world, but not of the world. And that does not mean, so King Yakovic, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Uh -uh. That's what he's talking about. It is an experiential kind of thing that you will have in your office, that you're so different, that you're such a carrier of light, that people in the office begin to notice there's something about you. You walk in such peace. You walk in such wisdom. You walk in such shalom. You have an expertise of fields that you've never trained for, but Jesus has become as wisdom unto you as the Bible says. And as they keep coming, if they lift you up or whatever it is, you point them to Jesus as the Lord enables. You pray for your workmates. You pray for your bosses. You pray for the office environment. If you're in a marketplace, you pray for the market. You sanctify it before God. You declare and decree that the glory of God must descend on that marketplace. Not witchcraft, not any other power. And then you get there early. Early enough to find a place. If you have an office, get there early enough to be able to lock your office so that nobody necessarily knows you're there. If at least your office is not made of glass or whatever it is, but you get there early enough to listen to worship music, to be able to still read the Bible online and wait upon the Lord online, but also maybe to read your emails as well once you're done. There's a way you prepare yourself when you're getting out of your house. You cover your family in the blood of Jesus Christ. You cover your day in the blood of Jesus Christ. You let God know that you're here for him to use. That's your early morning hour. Your lunch hour prayer time is about submitting yourself to the Lord. It's about going before the presence of the Lord and thanking him and also assessing, since when I woke up up to now, what do I need to repent of? I have encouraged you, if you have sinned at that moment and you feel the Holy Spirit telling you you have sinned, don't wait for lunch hour. Repent. Repent as doesn't mean, Shut up! Repetitive just been saying, God, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done that. God, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done, said that. And it's even in the heart. And sometimes if it's something you have just said, you can actually say it even to your boss. Your boss. You can say, oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have said that. And they think it is them you're telling, but it's God you're telling that. Because you're revoking what you have said. And in your heart, it's not something you're saying from here. You're saying it from your heart. Oh, I'm sorry. Then at lunch hour, if he, the Spirit of God reminds you, you revisit it. Now with a mourning. And also with an understanding where you can say to God, God, I've noticed. I keep having this thing. And I'm noticing it's a habit. Now when you notice you've done it once, twice, nini, it's a habit. So you need to ask the Spirit of God to tell you, where does this habit come from? It can be hurt. So that whenever you're offended, that's how you react. And the Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 165, that because I love your word, I do not get offended. So by the people who love the word of God, don't get offended. Yes, the offense may try to come, but you quickly have learned to let it go because you understand the power of offense to separate you from God. So you don't give anyone the luxury of offending you. It's about loving the word of God. That's the connection according to Psalm 119, verse 165. The understanding that we're in a war and I cannot afford even a second, even a second of being separated from God. And the Bible is clear. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, but sin can separate you from God. Okay? Not from his love, but from God. You can't afford it. So you need to walk blameless. And the way you walk blameless is continuously submitting yourself to the Lord. Don't let an hour pass by without taking a moment in your heart and just saying, thank you, Jesus. I just want to connect with you at this moment. It takes a minute of prayer. And it can even be in a classroom. It can be in the boardroom. And no one will see. You're even staring at the knee like this and in your heart. 
You've just told God, come into this meeting, Lord Jesus. I love you so much, Jesus. I've missed you. I can't wait for our lunch, our time together. And by the way, the lunch hour we are given is a one-hour lunch break. So one thing I learned is that we eat in 10 to 15 minutes. You can give God the 45 minutes. Find a place. Find a place. Find a place to submit yourself to the Lord. And when you go to pray, you're submitting yourself. You're saying, Father, in this noontime, I come to you right now. Is there something you'd like me to deal with? Then you wait upon the Spirit of God. And after the Spirit of God has spoken to you, then you're able to get into prayer. How does the Spirit of God speak to you? You think of someone. So you pray for that person. You think of an issue. So you bring that issue before the Lord. Something comes to you. And so you present it to Jesus. Submitted, submitted, submitted. Then in the evening as well, you're off work. Find a place where you can go. After all, kuna jamingi. Find a place where you can go. And you can find a place maybe that is not too far from your house even. Or your bedroom also works. You get into the house. Give God even 30 minutes. Even 30 minutes. Okay? And you know, the people in your house will believe that you've gone to shower, isn't it? And by the way, a shower is a fantastic place to talk to Jesus. Some of you can't talk to Jesus when you're naked. <laughs> talk to Jesus. Even 10 to 15 minutes is fine. And you're just thanking him for bringing you home safe. Your children are back home safe. Thank him for bringing them safe. Tell him I know that there's a mother crying today. I don't need to be told. Thank him that your spouse has come back home safe. Thank him for that nice smell that is coming from the kitchen. Never take anything for granted, brethren. There's a song that says that um, when we were growing up, we used to smell meat and we used to call people who, who, who cook meat rich people. But then meat was a rare thing in our time. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord you didn't get any warning letter. Thank the Lord you didn't have any issues with your bosses. Or if you did, surrender them to him. Surrender them to him. Why do we do this? It's like... You know, as Christians, when we come from outside, it's like the way doctors come with their clothes, but they can't enter a theater yeah, with their normal clothes. They have to scrub, and then they wear other clothes. But also, when doctors and nurses come from hospital, they don't just go and grab their babies. They go and shower. They make sure they scrub their hands thoroughly. Then they change into other clothes, not the clothes they were with in the hospital. So what we are doing when we come in the evening and spend time in the presence of God, we are removing everything that the world may have released on us. And we're asking God to cleanse us by the blood of Jesus. We are checking for any wounds we may have received that day. We are checking for any injuries. We are checking for any defilement in just that little time. Then you go and attend to your family, do what you need to do with your family and all that. Then when your spouse has slept, for those of you who are married, and when the children have slept, then you can withdraw yourself into the presence of the Lord and learn to take your children to bed. What time do children sleep, by the way? Squeezy parenting. What time do children sleep? Ayla, what time do your children sleep? 7.30 p.m. What time do they wake up? I need to come for training. Our children sleep at 8 and the older ones sleep at 9. But of course, you know, the ones who are in high school and university, there's issues of homework and all that. So those ones we stopped trying to regulate. But they can't be watching TV and all that. Okay? So if you're up, it's because you still have homework and you're sorting out something. And for the little ones, we want to find out which homework is this you have. It means you didn't finish your goals in school. Okay? So children need to have a bedtime. And part of why children have a bedtime is so that you and your spouse can bond. Okay? There's a jumping and everywhere and da, da 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 So you minister to your spouse. And then when your spouse sleeps, you can either take a nap and get up, and that is your main time of warfare. Warfare. Because you have a lot of time. 
So now that's the time you go and you engage the issue of your unsaved family members, you deal with issues of generational curses, you deal with issues in the church, please pray for me and my family because we are ministering to you. Obviously, we'll come under attack to stop us from ministering to you, you know? Pray for your cell leader. That is the time you really engage in prayer and intense warfare and you deal with things. And that hour, the prayer thing is, yes, you will come and yes, thank you, Jesus, and all that, and you begin with worship and adoration, but you normally a lot of times you pace up and down. Shakara setere bojaya. Your papa says, my father must stand. For your word says, your word says that many are the plans of men, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will prevail. In my nation, it is the purposes of God that will prevail. Okay? So you can still make sure that during each of the other prayer times, you still take time especially to pray for Kenya and to pray for the church. It doesn't necessarily take long. So you can still take time, okay? Our time is running out. I definitely think this is a part one. Definitely, it is a part one. Second Thessalonians. Okay, let me go back to that prayer. I will never stop emphasizing that if you pray a little bit, you'll have a little power. If you pray more, you'll have more power. If you pray most, you'll have most power. And what is the power for? The power is not so that anybody can see. The power is to overcome the enemy and his schemes. The power is so that you can win souls for Jesus. The power is so that you can be a vessel that is used as a battle axe in God's hands. That's what the power is about. The power is so that you can stand and not fall. So that you can walk upright. The power is so that when temptation comes, you're able to overcome it. The power is so that you're able to tell when the enemy is trying to sway you by use of another Christian. Okay? So we, to be able to overcome the synagogue of Satan, you have to walk in intense prayer. And our prayer life is not something we walk around telling people, hey, I'm going over three hours. Why do you need to tell people? Prayer is a very secret affair. In fact, the Bible says, if you go talking about it, unless for you know, a particular purpose, you have already received your reward. So there'll be no reward for you in heaven. So if there was a crown that was there, an angel just pulls it away because you're looking for the reward of men and for the praises of men. And we have just read a scripture that talks about your praise is not in men, but in God. Amen? So let's learn to be dealt with by the Lord in our private time of prayer. When the Samaritan woman went and told people, come and see one who told me everything about myself, I'm sure they had been whispering about who she is, isn't it? By the time you have had six husbands, of course you're the talk of town. Uh -huh. And probably they wanted to know whether now this is the seventh husband. So I'm sure they were not just going those ones over here. Eh? Maybe they thought that maybe he was also going to make a, 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 a teaching on her. He said, some of you are just promiscuous. Like I met a woman. Is she here? Is she here? Yeah, you. I met you, but at least thank God you're saved now, you know. But when I met you, you were telling me how you have, you know. Maybe that's what they thought it was going to be, that kind of someone, juicy someone. But when they had him, when they met her seventh and true husband, because the Bible says that we are betrothed to one husband, who is Christ Jesus, that God may give us to him as a pure virgin, when she finally met her husband. Or rather, when they finally met her husband, they begged him to stay with them for two days. And he stayed because they were hungry for God. And he enjoyed ministering to them. But then, you know, there are congregations you don't enjoy ministering to. And then there are congregations you enjoy ministering to. Kuna mali na itangwa ni rudi, si rudi. Is it me? What's going on? Tell you. So anyway, um, you have to also be a congregation that, that, you know, someone loves to minister to. And by the way, the atmosphere of Sozo has changed. And if you check my someone's last year and this year, completely different. 
It's so easy to minister. I can feel you're receiving. I can feel you've been waiting upon the Lord. I can feel you're hungry for God. I can feel that your, your, your attention has shifted from any shenanigans and you're fixed on Jesus. Your hearts and your minds are on Jesus. You're truly hungry for the Lord, but I can still sense the laziness of not praying. If you're praying, don't feel guilty. But if you're not praying, can you please wake up and pray? Turn to someone and tell them, it's time to pray. I was reading Jude, actually, okay? So Jude chapter, uh, Jude, 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 where there's no chapter. It's verse, verse, let's go on to verse 3, yeah? Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I was compelled to write to you urgently, appealing that you fight strenuously for the defense of the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. The faith is the sum of Christian belief that was given verbally to believers. For certain people have crept in and noticed and be am to certain people have crept in and noticed. Na ukimwangalia umchungulie kidogo ujue kama ni yeye ama ni mwingine. For certain people have asked them in fact, ask them have you crept in and noticed? Until you don't ask your wife, we, 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 we. <laughs> we, husband and wife that would be drama. Hey, the things you don't do. Eh? For certain people have crept in and noticed just as if they were sneaking in by a side door. Remember what the Bible says, I think it's in the book of John, that the one who comes through the back door eh, is not the true shepherd, okay? That is a thief. They are ungodly persons whose condemnation was predicted long ago, for they distort the grace of our God into decadence and immoral freedom, viewing it as an opportunity to do whatever they want, and deny and disown our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you are fully informed once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe, who refused to trust and to obey and to rely on him. And angels who did not keep their own designated place of power, but abandoned their proper dwelling place, these he has kept in eternal chains under the thick gloom of utter darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and their adjacent cities, since they, in the same way as these angels indulge in gross immoral freedom and unnatural vice and sensual perversity, they are exhibited in plain sight as an example in undergoing the punishment of everlasting fire. Nevertheless, in the same way, these dreamers who are dreaming that God will not punish them also defile the body and reject legitimate authority. Are you hearing those things? Reject legitimate authority and revile and mock angelic majesties. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil, Satan, and arguing about the body of Moses, he did not dare bring an abusive condemnation against him, but he simply said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men sneer at anything which they do not understand, and whatever they do not know, they do know, sorry, and whatever they do know by mere instinct, like unreasoning, unreasoning and irrational beasts. By these things, they are destroyed. Woe unto them! For they have gone the defiant way of Cain. And for profit, they have run headlong into the era of, era, era, sorry, era of Balaam and perished in rebellion of mutinous Korah. These men are hidden reefs, elements of great danger to others. In your love feasts, when they feast together with you, Without fear, looking after only themselves, they are like clouds without water, swept along by the winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted and lifeless, wild waves of the ocean, flinging up their own shame like foam, wandering stars, for whom the gloom of deep darkness has been reserved forever. It was about these people that Enoch 
in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied when he said, Look, the Lord came with myriads of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly deeds that they have done in the ungodly way and of all the harsh and cruel things ungodly sinners have spoken about him, the Lord. These people are habitual murmurers, griping and complaining, following after their own desires and controlled by passion. They speak arrogantly, pretending admiration and flattering people to gain an advantage. It goes on to talk about keeping yourself in the love of God. In everything we do, we must check, are we speaking in the love of God? Are we acting in the love of God? By the way, I want you to just hold your chest like this, which is significant of your heart, and I want you to say these words to the Lord from your heart. Say, Father, help me to begin to understand the value of a soul, that I will not act carelessly with souls. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when we're in the church, one of the things we have to understand is the sensitivity of how easy it is to hurt, to wound, to destroy. You see, we live in a body. And there's this body, but there's this body. So we're in a community of Christians. So what we do has consequences on someone else. Can you hear what happened with the lady who decided she was sleeping with someone? I started to diarrhea from wherever I was. Okay? So when one person in the body does something, you're not, you're not your own. You're not your own. The Bible says, I am not my own. I was bought with a price. I was bought with a price, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. So we are not our own. We are part of a body. When I make a decision, it affects everybody. If you're a couple and you get married, and then you decide you're going separate ways, it's not just your marriage. It's our marriage as the body of Christ. So when you decide you're going to go separate ways, who are we going to choose? Because it normally comes across like we have to choose. Who is going to come to Sozo and who's not going to come to Sozo? And this is my issue, by the way, with young people starting to form tutus. Eh? Wawiri kwa wawiri. Because unless you're going to get married, please don't bring us that drama. When you start to, to date, I call it dating in this case because it's not courtship. You, I don't know, 18 or 19. Are you getting married next year? What are you doing? And then, after that, you two are not talking to each other. So everybody's just uncomfortable. You know, if I'm found talking to the chick and the guy appears, like you're pretending... I wasn't talking to them. You know, it makes everybody uncomfortable. Family members, when you have beef amongst yourselves, and we look at you and we admire you, but now you're having beef that you're not resolving. You know, by the time we come to the house of God, we need to look each other straight in the face and say, where? We are going to church tomorrow. We have to sort this thing out. We have to sort it out. We have to deal with these issues. We're going to church. You know, the other day, I don't even remember which forum I was in, but I was in a forum where the Lord brought us this scripture that says that when you go to the place of taking your offering, when you're taking your sacrifice. And you know, some people actually thought that it says that if you find that you have something against your brother, you should leave your sacrifice. But it doesn't say that. It says if you're taking your sacrifice before the Lord to the altar. What sacrifice are we bringing here today? Praise. You bring your tithes and offerings. You bring your own body as a living sacrifice. The Bible says if you realize that your brother has an issue with you. Please find that scripture for me, Kathy. I think it's in Matthew. Is it Matthew 7? If you realize, Matthew 7 or Matthew 5, I think. If you realize your brother has an issue with you, you leave that sacrifice and go and you make peace with your brother. Brothers and sisters, this faith we have received is difficult. You cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. People think, oh, let me get saved that my life will be easier. It will be easier in as far as God will protect you. God will shield you. But my friend, to be able to do the things God wants you to do, 
Oh, you need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. At you go to, you know, when you go to the place of prayer, yeah? These are holy hands, my friend. And you remember, Mulikosana na Buana Subui. Mulikosana na Bibi Subui. Mulikosana na your sister in the morning. You, you, went, you, uh, you disagreed. Let me read it because some of you are like, Ai. Hey, somebody has the smallest. Hey, it's Matthew chapter 5. I can't read that, my sister. I don't know how you do it, but God bless you so much. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 24. You can go there with me. This one I think we all need to check. Let's go to verse 23. Okay? In fact, this one we're going to read together. So that you don't say, Apostle, and it changed kaki to apple. I want you to read it so that you hear yourself reading it in whichever version. Let's start from verse 23. So, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and while there, you remember that your brother has something such as a grievance or a legitimate complaint against you. Leave your offering there at the altar and go. First make peace with your brother and then come and present your offering. I don't know if you need a moment to talk to Jesus. Anyone is feeling I need a moment to talk to Jesus? You guys have refused to be honest. You don't need a moment. I can see Tilani is being honest. Now, the two young ones who are being honest. Adults, can you take a moment and talk to Jesus? He prayed it at How many times have you gone to take your offering before God when you have a, your brother has an issue with you? Not you having an issue with them. Somebody, your brother is anybody, okay? Has an issue with you. Bow your head, kiddo, go and talk to Jesus while I drink some water. Please let's learn to repent when the Lord convicts us. Amen. If you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse you from your sin, to forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It is forgiven. Are you now seeing what we are talking about? We have to teach the real word of God. It makes people uncomfortable, but it will take you to heaven. I would rather be uncomfortable to a place where it leads me to the cross than be so comfortable that I move away from the cross. What the Lord is doing in this season, as I finish uh, today's sermon and will continue next week, by his grace and God willing, if Jesus does not come back by then. If you have not realized what God is doing, the Lord is preparing us for revival. That's what he's doing. It's cleaning up. It's cleaning up. It's cleaning up. All the filth, the nonsense, and all that. And brothers and sisters, we need to read the Bible. So that even when revival comes, we live in the word of God. Because part of what happens in revival is some people move indeed in the spirit of God and the power of God. But some people think, I don't want anybody to think I'm not receiving. So now you begin to fake it. Okay? I know that in the world we are told fake it till you make it, but not in the house of God. How can I fake it till you make it? It's you kneel at the feet of Jesus and let Jesus work on you and deal with you. Amen? Shall we just take a moment before the presence of the Lord, if you can kneel wherever you are, and let's have a conversation with the Lord based on the things that have come. Let's ask the Lord if any of us, you ask the Lord to search your heart, whether you have joined the synagogue of Satan without knowing, and this means you're into heresies, you're into lies, you're into things that abuse the grace of God, you've been maligning people, moving people away from God, raising up an authority that is contrary to the contrary, to the authority that is given of God. Yeah, so, and even accusing saints of God, being used by the enemy as an accuser of the brethren. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your throne of mercy and grace, and we thank you that that's what your throne is called. 
Because Lord, if it was called a throne of judgment, none of us would stand. And God, we want to repent. We want to repent, oh God, for being where we have been used by the enemy, oh Lord Jehovah God. Where our zeal has led us into sin. Where, Lord God, in our loneliness and the need to be accepted and received, we have moved into groups and cliques that we have no business being in, oh God. Father, you've been very, very clear that we need to completely stay away from those, oh God, who are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, those who are rumor mongers and all that, Father. On this particular one, of the people who will be there manifesting in the end time, those who um, carry a form of godliness while denying the power of the cross and the power of that, that move of God. Father God, you have told us those ones we pray for from a distance. So, Father, where we have associated ourselves with them and we have no business associating ourselves with them, Lord, we delink ourselves from them. We break the soul ties in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Now, I want you to say this prayer. If you believe, you may have gotten yourself connected. But even if you haven't, I would like you to still say this prayer just to be on the safe side. Say, Father God, thank you for your word today. For your word is life. And you have taught me and brought me life. In the name of Jesus, I repent for walking with those that hate you but sound like they love you. And right now, I disconnect myself from every soul tie with anyone from the synagogue of Satan. I give back to them the things that are theirs. I take back from them the things that are mine. I wash them in the blood of Jesus Christ and I cut off every influence from them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You might not have realized what has happened, but if you go and find somebody somewhere that doesn't want to talk to you anymore or doesn't want to reach out to you anymore, then you begin to know that there's something going on there. Let us be prayed up. Let us remember the purpose for which we are here. Our Lord Jesus Christ set an example by telling his disciples that my, my will is to do, my food is to do the will of the Father. My food is to do the will of the Father. Yeah, so that's what he said. He focused and said, my, my food is to do the will of the Father. But then Jesus used to fast. Okay, so he says, my, my food is to do the will of the Father. May this be our saying, even as we are fasting these 100 days, that my, my food is to do the will of the Father. And two, if there's more he added, and two, uh, fulfill what he sent me to fulfill. Does anybody know you're sent? When you are put on earth, you understand you've been sent? Everybody knows you've been sent. So you have an assignment that you must fulfill. And when you go before God, when you stand there, he will ask you about that assignment. He'll ask you, what did you do with what I sent you to do? So all of us have an assignment. And it's critical that we understand what our assignment is, by the way. Not everybody's assignment will be to come and preach in front here. But everyone has an assignment. And the Bible says that it is ordained for every man to die once and then face certain judgment. Our death is certain. And whether Jesus is coming back or not, you don't know about tomorrow. You don't know about tomorrow. So stop living as though your life is your own. It is not your own. And if you don't listen to my very gentle words that I'm saying here, you will meet another Jesus in heaven, and he's not the one I preach about here. As in the Jesus I preach about here is gentle. The Jesus I preach about here is full of grace. The Jesus who is in heaven, who deals with the dead, is the righteous judge. And the Bible tells us that his eyes are made of fire. I have seen him. I have seen him judging people who followed religion and not him. And he was throwing them into the fire. And they were shouting about what they followed. And he was telling them, yeah. Call that one who you followed. Yeah, call that day which you served. So let us work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Let us also understand that there are trials in our life, and some people are a trial in our lives, and there's nothing we can do about that. But we allow God, as we submit ourselves, not to become bitter, not to become, you know, let me say embittered, because that is a bitterness that comes through somebody else. Let's not allow ourselves. If God allowed you to be in that situation and has not taken away that situation, then his grace will preserve you in that place so that you do not sin against him. 
You've got to believe that. You've got to believe that and walk with the Lord and let the Lord be your master and your savior. In the house of the Lord this morning, is there anyone, this afternoon I think, is there anyone who'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your savior and your Lord? You're saying, Jesus is not my savior, he's not my Lord. For sure, I'm of the synagogue of Satan, not even from a position where I'm born again and then I'm misbehaving, but I've been persecuting Jesus, I need to get saved today. I've heard this word and I must get saved today. Kuna mtiyote haujaokoka. No, no, you are sai, lazima wokoke. Ato na iskia kwa roo yako, you can feel there's something there burning, like an urgency or a panic. Like if you don't get saved now, something is about to happen. Please, brothers and sisters, anything could happen. You could get out of here and go and find a shootout. And then before you know it, you've been shot and you're dead. And you did have an opportunity to say you're sorry. Somebody the other day was driving a KCX, brand new Mercedes. I'm sure he did not get an opportunity to repent if he was not born again. Don't ever assume and don't ever let Satan deceive you that the day of your death, you will get an opportunity to repent. Don't ever let that happen. You could get a stroke and go into a coma and you find yourself, even though you're, not, you're between these two worlds, but you're not aware of what's going on. Is there someone here who is not born again and you're saying, I can't leave this house without giving my life to Jesus? Just lift your hand up in the air and I'll see it from wherever you are. Anybody? I am not born again and I need to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. I need this Jesus. I need this Jesus. My life can't go on like this. Maybe your life is a mess. And you know people say my life is a mess and you're not born again. Of course your life will be a mess when you're not born again. Is there anyone in the house of God today? Is there anyone online? So that we can pray with you. You want to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Wow. Let's appreciate this little girl. You know, there's tears in her eyes. That's how you know it's not mommy who has made her come. She has chosen to come. Amen. Is there anyone else who'd like to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord today? I'm not born again. Jesus is not my Savior and Lord. I need a Savior. I need a Savior. I need a Savior. You're saying I need a Savior. Online, is there anyone? Nobody so far. All right, we'll go on. Little girl, I want you to repeat this after me, okay? Say, close your eyes and talk to Jesus, okay? Say this to Jesus, what I'm saying, okay? Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. here I am. Forgive me, Forgive me my sins. My sins. I, have heard I have heard your word. Your word. And, I choose and I choose to receive you, to receive you today. today. So, forgive me so forgive me and wash me in the blood, and wash me in the blood of, Jesus Christ. of Jesus Christ. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Lord, Jesus, Lord Jesus, now come into my heart. Be my savior, be my savior, and my Lord. And my Lord. From today, from today, I choose, I choose to follow you. To follow you. Teach me, teach me your ways, your ways, and use me, and use me for your glory. For your glory. I thank you. I thank you. Because today, because today, I am saved. I am saved. I'm part of the family. I'm part of the family of God. And I thank you, my God. And I thank you, my God. And my Father. And my Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come here, sweetheart. God bless you. How old are you? How old are you? Four. You're four. I would have loved to get saved at four years old. Isn't it beautiful? Lord Jesus lives in your heart. Okay, can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, thank you for this precious four-year-old little girl. My God, may you keep her even unto that day. 
Thank you for saving her this day, Master Savior. We lay hands on her, O oh God, and we declare, O oh God, that the purposes of the Lord in her life, they shall stand. Father God, we thank you, O oh God, because your promises to her are here and amen. And Lord, she will stand in the name of Jesus Christ. I even rebuke that cough and that cold, and I command you to be removed and healed in the name of Jesus Christ, for she's a new vessel and a new creation, and healing is her portion in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Give me a high five. Well done. Well done. All right. So we're going to follow this auntie. Her name is Kathy. She'll take you to the back and record your details, okay? Do you have a, mo a, mo a mobile number? <laughs> I'm just playing with you, okay? And mommy will help you as well, okay? Mommy will also hug you, all right? Let's just appreciate the little brave girl. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. <sighs> Finally, brethren. Let us meditate upon what the Lord has taught us today. Let us review our notes through the week and remember that salvation, we cannot stand by ourselves. We need one another. But we also need to be able to work out our own personal salvation with fear and trembling. Because one day we will stand before the righteous judge sooner than you expect. So let us be able to stand fearlessly before him, knowing that we kept the faith in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. If you're not a member of a cell group, there is a cell group near you. If you'll go to the back, you'll find somebody at the back. The same Kathy is available at the back, and she'll be able to hook you up to a cell group, okay? Yes. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runs over. Not my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's let the Spirit of Lord, the Lord lead us. The Bible is very, very clear that for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For those who are in the discipleship class, uh, please get ready to come to the front. Then I'm going to ask everybody else if you can just take time and uh, be quiet. We're going to give it about 10 minutes. Uh, for settling and all that, and then we can go off. The other thing I need to mention, uh, just two things. The landlord has been getting very upset uh, because of uh, a few things. Um, as you're aware, the place we are in is in a kind of different business from the church business. So I'll ask you not to stand praying in the parking areas and on the corridors and all that because it makes the customers uncomfortable. And uh, we're not here to make anybody comfortable, but we know what we are saying, right? You guys are hearing what I'm saying. So please let us not uh, upset him. He's given me a call for the second time. The other thing is I think a few people after or, or during the Kesha, I don't know, they went to the rooms. Apparently some got into bed and were watching um, TV. So, you know, you even look and you're like, what is going on? What is going on, you know? So if there's a problem with our washrooms, there are actually washrooms near the gate, okay? So those are open washrooms for everybody in the compound. But you can't say you're a Christian, and then you go into one of the rooms that are normally paid for, you get into bed, you sleep, and all those things, and start watching TV as well. So I don't know which Bible you're reading, but that is actually, it falls under the category of criminal and theft because you haven't paid for that room, so you can't take that room. Are we together? So let's not do that, let's not allow that, but also I'm going to ask our ushers to please be alert. Let's be alert. Let's be very, very alert ushers, okay? And especially when you're having keshas and uh, uh, solemn assemblies and all that, it seems like that's the time that people decide to do a few things that are uh, against the ground rules. But basically this is the place that um, the landlord has given us, okay? 
So let's, let's avoid a lot of things out there. And then, of course, finally, I need to mention that for the children, don't let children go running. For the guards, please don't let any child go out by themselves without any, any adult supervision. Amen. God bless you all. Sorry? Oh, yeah, crusade. <coughs> so um, we have the crusade this coming uh, Saturday. Crusades are very exciting, by the way. We had said we're going to have quite a number of crusades. Um, so we'll start off in Kibera this coming Saturday, which is the 29th of uh, this month. And then we will continue. So it's at 3 p.m. Um, in Kamkunji grounds. Eh? You may have heard of Kamkunji grounds. They're easily found. Um, so we'll be in Kamkunji grounds. And then on Sunday, we'll still be on the same grounds. If you want to give to us the crusade, you can also just send us a love offering and just say it's for the crusade. Okay? Sawa, sawa. But let's turn up. Let's turn up. We're going to be needed. We're going to need to, to, to help with, uh, you know, different things um, that are needed in a crusade. Normally, it's the church that now serves as all of us, okay? So let's show up. It, it begins at exactly 3 p.m. Um, and then on Sunday as well, we'll be there as well at 3 p.m. Once we come from here, we'll dash there. In the meantime, through the week, let's pray for it, okay? Let's pray for it. Kibera has quite a number of people from what I heard. I can't quite get the figures, but it's well over a million people. And uh, they, you know, those are many souls. Those are many souls. Amen? Amen. So we thank God for the Kibera uh, Pastors Network and the pastors of Kibera. They've stood with us, over 500 pastors. They're the ones who are circulating um, all the flyers and everything. So we thank God for that. Amen? Amen. All right. God bless you. Thank you for coming in today. And next week, please invite somebody.